Ten years ago, the Warkowski brothers moved to California to make a movie. It turns out that coming up with ideas for a movie isn't particularly difficult. It turns out that dreaming up costumes in a whole other world and a story is something a lot of people can do. But what was interesting about what the Warkowskis did is they made a movie. Right? And the Matrix happened because they finished it. I don't have a lot of time. Candle goes to about there. And what I want to do before the candle burns out is sell you on a pretty simple idea that's not that hard to understand, but is pretty difficult to embrace. Never talked about this before in public, so I'll do my best, but I hope you'll bear with me. Uh, so I want to start by giving you a couple examples of what I'm trying to get at here. It's not that hard to uh, dream up some clever ways to start a talk and get people's attention. The balloon. Lucky for me there's no hole in it. If this works, there we go. Not that hard to add some air. What's hard is taking a water balloon and throwing it into the audience, hoping it won't pop and embarrass you in front of all these people who came to hear you talk. <laughs> the last part, that's the hard part. The water part, the syringe part, that part wasn't so hard. So I want to tell you a couple stories about the real life implications of this. Some of you may know that there actually was a guy named Duncan Hines. Duncan Hines in 1899 was working for Wells Fargo and his assignment was to take a horse and buggy across Colorado to some far outpost. Well, he pulled the horse over, he saw a house, he went into the house for some food. The house was deserted, it was snowing, he lost the horse, he lost the buggy. He was stranded in the middle of Colorado. For three days, he wandered around looking for the horse and buggy. For three days, he didn't have anything to eat. Finally discovered that he'd gone in a giant circle on his way back to civilization, found the horse, found the buggy, got to civilization, pulled into the town, and went to the only place there was to eat and ordered five orders of ham and eggs. Had an argument with the chef. They compromised on three. He ate them all. Turns out that in the 1890s, the 1900s, 1910s, finding a restaurant in which to eat where you wouldn't get tomain poisoning was extremely difficult because the only people who would go to a restaurant lived in town. Traveling salesmen had a hard time of it. Duncan Hines ended up getting a job as a traveling salesman, selling printing in Chicago. That ham and egg experience never went away. And he spent 10 or 15 years as he went around the Midwest keeping copious notes on where to eat and where not to eat. Not a particularly vivid idea. Then, one year for Christmas, he and his wife mailed his notebook, little mimeographed copies of his notebook, to their Christmas list. And so many people asked for it again the next year that it occurred to Duncan Hines that maybe there were other people, thanks to Henry Ford, who were traveling around who needed a place to go and eat without getting sick. And Duncan Hines led a quest, a quest to create the restaurant industry in this country, a quest to, to increase health standards, a quest to teach people how to eat. And every year, year after year, basically by himself, aided by an ever-rotating group of secretaries, he produced the original Zagats. It was called Duncan Hines' Guide to Good Eating. And then he added a cookbook, and then he added a hotel list. And what's fascinating is, when he died, he only had $25,000 in the bank. Duncan Hines didn't do this for the money. Duncan Hines did it because he did things. When he started something, he finished it. The interesting footnote on the story is about 1950-something, a guy named Roy Park decided it would be really interesting to take the Duncan Hines name and add it to a line of foods. Another interesting idea. Lots of people had had the idea before, and no one had even gotten to first base with Duncan Hines. He wasn't interested. Duncan wanted to control what he did. He wanted to make the things that he made. And as a result, no one got in front of Duncan Hines with this. Roy Park spent months figuring out how to make the initial approach until finally they hit it off, and then they started working together, and it ended up becoming a company so big 
that when Roy Park died 10 years ago, he was number 175 on the Forbes list, and he had $500 million in cash in the bank. The interesting thing about the two stories, it seems to me, that what they have in common is they are about finishing, not about starting. The idea of a notebook filled with restaurants in which to eat isn't particularly difficult to understand. So the guys at 37 Signals, right in almost everything they talk about, say that there are two secrets to shipping, actually one, to shipping something on time and on budget. And the secret is when you run out of money or you run out of time, you ship. Then you're on time and on budget. And if your mindset is that I ship, that's not just a convenient shortcut. It's, in fact, an obligation. And you build your work around that obligation. That instead of becoming someone who's a wandering generality and someone who has lots of great ideas and if only, if only, if only, you are someone who always ends up shipping. I've had many, many, many products. The vast majority of the things I've written or created or organizations I built fail. But the reason that I've managed a modicum of success is because I just keep shipping. And if you're proud of what you ship and you ship on time and on budget, you get to do it again. And then you get to do it again. So if we read Steve McConnell's great book on software product management, we discover this idea of thrashing. Here's what happens in almost every software project. And the reason I think you should read the book, even if you don't make software, is it happens in any project where there's more than a couple people involved. What happens is someone comes up with a neat idea of something to make. And they start working on it, and they start working on it, and then they get a little bit of funding, and they get a little bit of support, and then some other programmers get added. But about a month or a couple months, or in Microsoft's case, a year before it ships, other people start to get involved. Other people start wanting to look at the user interface. Other people start weighing in. And about two months before it ships, thrashing occurs. People start ripping things out and putting things in. And the closer you get to deadline, the more thrashing occurs. The more cycles get expended. The more work gets put into it. Until eventually you ship not on time and not on budget. And Steve's idea, which is actually adopted by Microsoft and other smart programming shops, some places better than others, is really simple. You must thrash at the beginning. Because thrashing at the beginning is cheap. Thrashing on your website when it's still in Photoshop is cheap. Thrashing on it when it's already been put into Flash is expensive. That what you need to do is realize that what you do for a living is not be creative. Everyone is creative. What you do for a living is ship. And as someone who knows how to ship, you have a discipline. And part of your discipline is that you insist on thrashing early. That you say to everyone in the organization, we are having a thrashing meeting for this thing that's shipping in a year. And if you don't come now, you have to sign a piece of paper promising that you will not talk to us again. <laughs> and when I worked at a software company, I don't know if I have any examples of that, when in the early 80s, my boss was the king of thrashing. David was great, but he loved to show up the day before we were going to ship with just one little suggestion. And that led to one little bug, which led to a whole round of playtesting, which led to sh shipping dates going away. And so I created the form. And I, 24 years old, walked into the president's office and made him sign it six months before the product was going to ship. I have seen the spec. I will not talk to you again. He didn't have to sign it. He could come talk to me now, or he could sign it. But no one was going to work on the project until he did it either one. That is the discipline of what a creative artist does. So the question that inquiring minds will ask is, why does it work this way? Why do human beings sabotage their work so often? And so I've got to give you a little bit of a biology lesson, and then I'm going to talk about why that is. So this is a chicken. A chicken has a lizard's brain. Chickens and dinosaurs, they're all related. The lizard brain is the brain that you see if you look at a sonogram of a fetus. Right? A little early fetus has a tail and has a little tiny thing on the top of its brain stem. That as you watch the fetus develop through sonograms, you can see the path of evolution. It shows you, day by day, how human beings evolved. And it turns out that all lizards and chickens have is a lizard brain, an amygdala, as, as, as they say. And the idea of the lizard brain is this. It is hungry, it is scared, it is selfish, and it is horny. That's its job. 
and that's all it does. The reason they call wild animals wild is because they have lizard brains. And all they care about in any given moment, when you see a squirrel in Central Park, or when you see something scampering across the street is, how am I going to survive? How am I going to have kids? Get me out of here. <laughs> it turns out that we have one too. And if you look in the Wikipedia, there it is. There's a little picture of it, and there's the other brain on top. And that as evolution came along, that little one went there, and then we grew this new one on top, the limbic system and the neocortex. That's what dogs had first, and then apes and people like us. That part is all about how do I share? How do I be loyal? How do I connect? And then the part on top of that is how do I come up with a really cool way to do something? How do I break tradition? How do I challenge the status quo? And we love living up here. But every single time we get close to shipping, every single time the manuscript is ready to send to the publisher, the lizard brain speaks up. The lizard brain, by the way, was in charge of you in high school. <laughs> and the lizard brain says, they're going to laugh at me. The lizard brain says, I'm going to get in trouble. What? TV is coming to watch me put graffiti on street signs? I'm going to get arrested. The lizard brain is screaming at the top of its lungs. And so what happens is we don't do it. We sabotage it. We hold back. We have another meeting. Of course we're going to come to the meeting before ship date because that's the moment when our lizard brain is saying, uh-oh, the critics are going to get to see this. We might have to change it. So what I'm trying to start unfolding for you here is the fact that you don't need to be more creative. All of you are actually too creative that what you need is a quieter lizard brain. And there are some interesting ways to think about this. So we're going to go back to my friendly plunger here. Most people at work are doing this, back and forth, back and forth, following instructions, doing what they're supposed to do. That, for most people, is a great job. Because the lizard brain is quiet all day long. All day long, you know, you sit there, you fix one, uh, Metro card machine, then you fix the next metro card machine, then you fix the next metro card machine, and at the end of the day, you get a paycheck. And you don't get in trouble, and you don't get laid off, and that's your job. And we've been taught to do that for a really long time. But what creative people do is they try to change the status quo. It's a little bit like taking this and blocking the air. Now, one of the things that happens when you pull on it is it's not that hard to pull, and it's sort of fun. So you pull and you let go, you pull and you let go, you pull and you let go. And that's what amateur creative people do all day long. They come up with an idea, they write it down in their Moleskine. They come up with an idea, <laughs> and they post it on their blog. right? And this part, we spend a lot of time doing this, going back and forth. But you notice what happens? What happens is the plunger is still where it was when I started talking about it. Every once in a while, we commit to something, and we start pulling. But you know what happens? It gets harder and harder and harder as the vacuum gets stronger and stronger and stronger. So we give it our best, but we let go. That, Stephen Pressfield calls the resistance. The resistance gets worse and worse and worse the closer we get to shipping. And the reason is because of the lizard brain. The lizard brain says, I need to speak up now because they're going to make fun of you. And there are a few people, right? One of my favorites, Jill Greenberg, who she gets this far. And you know what she does? She pulls harder until she breaks the status quo. And then everything is different. And everyone says, wow, you're a genius. Right? The genius part is getting the lizard brain to shut up long enough to overcome the resistance. And the way that I've thought about it is this. Some people view what they're doing as pulling on that plunger, trying and trying and trying. And what happens when you approach life like that is you get this feeling in the pit of your stomach or in the back of your head. And the list of valid excuses is long and getting longer all the time. Right? I'm an alcoholic. I can't be expected to do that. I'm not an alcoholic yet, but I like to drink. <laughs> I like to drink, and my friends haven't seen me in a really long time. I have a family to support. I can't afford to do that. That guy's blog's already too big. My blog will never catch up with it. I can't possibly do this because there's something wrong with the committee system. My boss won't let me. The list is really, really long. and Everything on the list is great. You know why? Because we organize to be great at having that list. We like having that list, especially the lizard brain. 
The other way to think about it, though, second balloon, is these things. Now, I was never good at this. And the reason I was never good at this is it turns out, if you've ever tried it, that the first couple breaths are really hard. Getting started is the opposite of the plunger. Getting started with this is really hard. But if you do the physics, after the first two breaths, the percentage change in latex that you're making gets smaller and smaller and smaller with each breath. And that the model is, if you can get the first two breaths over with, you're going to get the balloon filled up, because it's downhill from there. So the way I look at the resistance, even before I knew what it was called, is pretty straightforward. If I'm going to do the first two breaths, I'm going to finish it. So I'm really obsessively careful about what I decide to do the first two breaths about. Because I know that if I start it, then it's all downhill. I'm gone. I'm going to ship. So I thrash at the beginning. Right? At the beginning, there's lots and lots and lots of argument and discussion with the lizard brain. Lots and lots and lots of, of thinking and scenario planning that says, wait a minute, if I do these first two breaths, if I start thinking about a cover or a thesis or whatever, I'm going to finish it. So I better decide now. The end result is you get a lot of spare time on your hands because you're not resisting. You're not delaying. You're not saying, oh, I need to see this next episode of Mad Men because there might be something useful in it for the next thing I'm going to write. You don't have that conversation because you're already over the first two breaths and it's all downhill from there. So I, I have two things to, to say in closing. The first one um, is maybe a small opportunity, which is my current obsession is people who are doing sort of brave status quo, changing work, and shipping it. So if you have an example of that, email it to me if you feel like it, seth at sethgodin.com. I'd appreciate it. The second thing, much more important, is this. Some of you came here today to pay homage to the resistance. Because if you're at a conference sharpening the saw, you can't possibly be expected to do productive work. You can't possibly be expected to ship the next big thing. You're at a conference. But some of you came here today because of the voice in your limbic system or your neocortex is saying, you know, you're a lot better than the people who are just frustrated. And maybe, because you notice it's not a creativity conference, it's a shipping conference, maybe there's a different way of thinking about where you are right now. My guess, talking to Scott and the other folks who are running this thing, is that some of the best and brightest and highest potential people in New York are here today. And I want to argue that you don't have the opportunity to do this. You have the obligation to do it. Because we need the work you're doing. We need your genius. We need your insight. And I'm praying and hoping you go do it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you.